Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our weekly update. I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Lawrence Lowe, our Medical Officer of Health here in the region of Peel, Nancy McDonald Duncan, our Acting Fire Chief and Director of our Emergency Management, and today, Louis Manzo, owner of a local business, Cabin Barber and Gentleman Supplies, as well as John Pappas, owner of the Crooked Q in Mississauga, a local Mississauga restaurant. Thank you all for joining me today. <clears throat> Before I give my update, I first want to talk a little bit about my close friend, advisor, and mentor, Hazel McCallion. Hazel McCallion has served the people of Mississauga for more than five decades. And on top of her incredible political career, she's raised millions of dollars for local charities, for Trillium Health Partners, for Sheridan College, the University of Toronto, and countless other organizations. The city of Mississauga had not yet formally honored Hazel for her service to our city. So it's only fitting that we mark her 100th birthday next year. Council has officially approved the renaming of our central library, the Hazel McCallion Central Library, in her honor. Looking around the city, Hazel's fingerprints are on everything, from our booming downtown core to our commitment to economic development and prosperity. Hazel is everywhere, and I'm so proud that we can honor her legacy for generations to come right in the heart of our city. We can't wait to unveil the new Hazel McCallion Central Library in the next year on February 10th, 2021. Thank you, Hazel, for everything you have contributed to Mississauga and beyond. As many of you already know, the province moved Peel Region into the gray lockdown zone um, as part of the COVID-19 response framework. I know that many of you are disappointed I'm disappointed too. This is not where any of us want to be. This is particularly devastating for our small business community. As most have had to move online and to curbside pickup and delivery, right as the holiday season approaches and begins to ramp up. I also know that it's tough for our faith-based groups as most have had to move to virtual services as the new rules only permit a maximum of 10 people for any indoor religious service. The reality is that COVID-19 cases in hospitals have risen sharply in Mississauga over the last month. The province's decision was made in an effort to avoid school closures, further to uh, or avoid further spread to our long-term care homes, and to avoid overburdening our already at capacity hospitals. Most importantly, it was made to limit preventable deaths in Mississauga. Our numbers to date have continued to rise. Peel Region is averaging 441 new daily COVID cases, Mississauga averaging 124 new daily cases, and this is over a one week period. Our hospitals continue to see a flux of cases and are now stretched to their absolute limits. With Trillium Health Partners currently dealing with 61 COVID hospitalizations, 11 patients in ICU, and 114 pending suspected cases. That's 175 rooms allocated for just COVID or COVID suspected cases. In Brampton, William Osler Hospital has 62 COVID hospitalizations, 11 patients in the ICU, and another 50 suspected pending cases. But we have seen a bit of promising news. With Mississauga's test positivity rates lowering to 6.9%, and cases dropping to 100 per 100,000, that's 17 fewer per 100,000 than last week. These numbers, however, are still well above the provincial average. We are seeing more and more spread to our most vulnerable communities, our residents in congregate settings. 16 of our long-term care homes are now in outbreak, along with seven retirement homes and four group homes. Our Tyndall Seniors Village has seen a massive outbreak with more than 90 residents and 60 staff testing positive for COVID. 
I know COVID fatigue is setting in, and I completely understand that. Everyone has already had to make huge sacrifices, and we now have been asked to make even more. But I know that together we can pull through this better than we've done before. We have to do this to avoid a larger and longer lockdown and even stricter measures. Letting our guard down now would be devastating to our community, especially as we move closer and closer to a viable vaccine. I do want to be clear. The provincial restrictions are in place are temporary measures. The Premier has given me his word that he will be reviewing our case numbers every two weeks to determine the path forward for our city and for our region. And I want to thank everyone in Mississauga who is doing their part, playing their role, to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. People continue to listen to the advice of public health. They're staying at home, except when going out for the essentials. And we ask that they continue to limit their close in-person contact to just their immediate households and their essential supports. This is the only way we will be able to see the loosening of restrictions. Now, I was very disappointed to see that over the weekend, huge numbers of people going out to shop at the malls. This is not the time to shop, folks. It's the time to stay home and go out for only the essentials. This goes against the direct advice of our public health officials. We're now also seeing large lineups at our big box stores like the Walmarts and the Costcos. Let me be clear about this. Only go out to buy the essential items once per week. Go out once a week to buy your groceries, that's it. Do not region hop to go out shopping or to dine out. The virus is controlling us. We are not controlling this virus. It also truly concerns me that people are going out to these big box outlets and buying more than just the essentials. And this can only lead to longer visits at the stores and increases the chance of transmission. And because of that, I and my council members will be putting a, a motion forward at Regional Council tomorrow that will ask our Medical Officer of Health to limit big box stores from selling non-essentials. We'll be putting this motion forward for the health and safety of our residents. But also to level the playing field for our smaller retailers. I know that many of our small retailers are barely hanging on. They've been asked to close their in-person shopping at the most critical time of year for their bottom line, at a time when they make upwards of 50 to 60 percent of their annual revenues. And it is simply unfair that big box stores can continue to sell non-essential items to people in their stores, while small retailers cannot. Big box stores are open right now to sell essential goods not televisions, not sports equipment, and not home decor. They do not need to have any further competitive advantage. Our small businesses are run by our families, our friends, and our neighbours in our community. We cannot afford to see them close their doors permanently as a result of this lockdown. So along with putting limitations on big box stores, I'm again urging residents to buy Mississauga Made, this Christmas through online orders, through curbside pickup and delivery. That jacket you're planning to buy, those hair products you think you need, those coffee beans, those baby clothes, that new watch, please, please buy them from one of our incredible small local businesses. And please commit to ordering takeout at least once a week from our amazing restaurants as much as you can. They need us now more than ever. I want to speak to our small business owners, so I'm incredibly sorry for what you're going through. I understand uh, why you feel your concerns haven't been addressed, and I encourage you to please apply for all the federal and provincial business supports. And you have my word that I will continue to advocate for you for more help from our provincial and federal counterparts. Many businesses have also asked me why Mississauga continues to be in lockdown when they feel that Brampton more often uh, has numbers that are, case numbers that are more than double our case numbers. The short answer is this. We are one singular public health unit. 
And we have seen evidence that when one city or region is in lockdown, there will be a spillover effect. With people traveling to other regions to shop or to dry out. Our numbers right now are also too high to advocate for Mississauga to be out of lockdown. But I'm making a commitment to you here today that if our numbers begin to decrease uh, while the whole region continues to rise, I will advocate for a more tailored approach, a surgical approach as the Premier likes to call it, for Mississauga. I've already discussed this with Dr. Lowe, our Medical Officer of Health, and with the Premier numerous times. But in order for this to happen, we all need to continue doing our part to get this virus under control. And that's by staying home, except when going out for the essentials, by limiting our close personal contacts to our immediate households and our essential supports, and by following the advice of public health. I need everyone to do their part. Before I bring up Dr. Lowe, I want to again urge both the federal and the provincial government, as well as the private sector, to step up and to reassure workers who test positive for COVID-19 that they will not be penalized. There is plenty of evidence that people with symptoms are going to work and not getting tested because they think self-isolation will mean a loss of their jobs or of their paychecks. We need a simple, straightforward solution to provide sick pay for everyone who needs it. And this is critical to helping us drive our numbers down. And with that, I'd now like to invite Dr. Lowe to come up and provide us with his weekly update. Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, fellow guests. Good afternoon, Ms. Saga. As of noon today, Peel Public Health has investigated 8,032 cases of COVID-19 in Mississauga, and of the 725 are active, 7,034 have resolved, and 264 have passed away. The current situation in Mississauga reflects that of Peel and other districts in the Greater Toronto Area with widespread community transmission. Rates of COVID-19 in Mississauga currently sit at 100 cases per 100,000, which is 2.5 times higher than even the lower end of the red control zone boundary under the province's, control, uh, province's response framework. I have always maintained that a community must and should reopen with confidence when COVID is under control. However, the flip side of a balanced approach of this nature is that when the balance tips to controlling COVID, you must control COVID. At this point in our second wave, we are past the point of talking about what should be opened and what should be closed or arguing about the source of transmission. The reality is that risk and transmission exists everywhere in our community at this point in time. We've seen it because we've had to streamline our contact tracing to prioritize timeless in the face of significant caseloads. We've seen that our hospitals are at capacity with a surge of patients being seen week after week patients being admitted without beds, ICUs, and also ICUs filling up, and patients also being transferred outside of our community. In these moments, we need to act decisively and quickly to save lives and protect our frontline healthcare workers. The recent provincial decision, while unfortunate, is designed to immediately reduce in-person interactions, especially in higher risk settings where physical distancing and masking is a challenge to maintain consistently. We remember that the disease cannot spread if people are not meeting. I absolutely feel for the businesses and the people that have been impacted by this decision. I urge all business owners to make use of the supports available through the Ontario Main Street Relief Grant Program. And I call for more supports for businesses and affected individuals to ensure that they can weather this storm. I also thank everyone in our community who has stood up to do their part. For the faith leaders and community leaders who have reached out, knowing what the stakes are, and then closing down. For the business leaders who, again, sacrificing, are working to keep our schools safe and our long-term care homes safe as well. This is not a setback. 
This is a necessary pause to keep each other safe and beat back this disease. So let's take care of each other and let's make sure the supports are in place so that we can again control COVID-19 and reopen with confidence. Many people point out the negative impacts of closures on mental health and well-being, livelihoods, people's connectedness. We absolutely must mitigate these. But we also remember that in communities where the virus has run rampant, those exact same challenges exist, along with the added toll of lives lost and illness because of the virus. There are no good choices in a pandemic. None of our decisions have been taken easily. These are the decisions we are taking now to save lives, protect the healthcare system, and in the long run, reduce the impacts of this pandemic on our community. We must also take this time now to address the other drivers of transmission in Peel. We continue to engage with our community to identify and reach our most vulnerable and fight household transmission with a voluntary isolation center. We continue to fight workplace transmission in essential workplaces with advocacy for paid sick days, better worker protections, and workplace inspection blitzes. And we must fight spread in social situations by taking the precautions seriously. Stay home as much as possible during this period. Leave only for the most essential reasons, work, school, healthcare, exercise, and procuring necessities. When you meet in person outside your home, please distance, mask, and wash your hands. Don't go out if you're sick. Get tested and self-isolate, including from people in your home. Don't hold or attend any gatherings, and especially not in your own home. By taking these precautions over the next few weeks, and by putting in additional measures to address the disparities in our community, this pause will not go to waste. Ultimately, no one is truly safe from COVID until all of us are safe from COVID. And together we can support those who are sacrificing to keep us safe, while we also support the most vulnerable in our, society, in our community who are taking the brunt of this disease head on. Thank you and I'll pass it back to Madam Mayor. And now I'd like to invite up Louis Manzo from Cabin Barber and Gentlemen's Supply. I saw Louis yesterday on TV speaking about the impact the pandemic is having on him and his business and other local businesses in the Port Credit and larger Mississauga area. And it made a real impact on me. And so I invited him here today to talk to you a little bit about what he's been dealing with and why it's more important than ever to support our local businesses. Louis, come on up. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for having me and allowing me to at least try to be a voice for small business in our community. I said yesterday that I think we're rearranging the chairs on the Titanic and waiting for the orchestra to play us out. And these words couldn't be more than true. It's been a devastating challenge for small business, as we all know, you can only imagine. The first lockdown that we faced presented challenges that we'd never had to consider before. And in saying that, I think small business being resilient and being innovative rallied behind each other, came up with ways that we could become safe inside our environments. And I think for the most part, small business did an amazing job in creating environments that were safe, not only for our staff, but for our community. Those were our number one priorities. And so we invested deeply into protocols. We invested into creating a business that we had never thought we'd want to run. And we moved along and saw a glimmer or a shining hope that things were beginning to return, only to find, of course, that numbers were rising and that we're challenged again by a shutdown that this time, knowing what we knew, we're confused because it seemed like we did everything we were supposed to. And despite that, we're looking down the barrel of a gun. Small business is the backbone of economies, and it certainly is the fiber and the culture of small communities. And our challenges grow day to day. We've invested heavily into stocking our shelves for a holiday season. 
And we're fortunate enough that we sell product and we invested in an online presence more recently to be prepared for what's next. But not all small businesses have the opportunity to do that. And they can't move as quickly as perhaps we did. So it's important to recognize that we're not all in the same boat. And although we'd like to be in this together, that perhaps we're not. And so my hope for you today is to consider first and foremost, that if you are considering purchasing gifts for this holiday season, and you're in a position to do so, then of course the idea and notion of shopping local is so critical to businesses like ours and the neighbors that surround you. You know, I have a business on Lakeshore in Mississauga, as well as two downtown. I'm a father, I'm a neighbor. I'm sorry, it's difficult not to be emotional when you think about how much we pour into our businesses and our communities to see that we might be challenged beyond our recognition. And I'm a friend, and to say that, I'm looking for all of us to consider how important it is to rally behind the small businesses and the communities that make up this incredible city that we live in. I'm hopeful, I remain optimistic, and I'm, most <clears throat> I'm mostly counting on you to help us. If you have the wherewithal, please consider shopping local, support the businesses that are in your communities, and please recognize that we can't compete with big box or online retailers that are established. We can't offer the likes of free shipping. <clears throat> big box means convenience. And I would suggest that convenience comes at a price, especially now. So please consider shopping local and supporting the businesses that make up your communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louie. And now I'd like to invite up John Pappas, the owner of the Crooked Q in Mississauga, also on Lakeshore. John has been an incredible advocate for his fellow business owners and those restaurant owners, continuing to push different levels of government to do as much as they can to ensure that businesses have the financial supports they need to get through this pandemic. And now I welcome up John Pappas to speak. John. Thank you so much, Mayor Crombie, for inviting me here today. Thank you, everybody, for being here, and thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to have this opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of affected businesses in my industry, as well as my local businesses in Mississauga. I want to first start to say thanks to Louis for telling everybody to shop local. That is so critical, uh, because we need that shop local and we need you to help us to get through this time. Uh, we are being supported by our government, but I'm here to tell you today that those supports may be a little, they're a little, they're a bit too little to get us through this crisis. Um, firstly, I'll say that we support the medical community. We want to follow all the safety protocols and we want to be part of the solution and, and flatten this curve together. We will do whatever it takes to keep our staff our customers, and the overall public as safe as possible. But today, the real issue for me and my business and businesses in my community is that while the government has given us new programs for rent subsidy, wage subsidy, and other programs, um, they're, and I know they're trying really hard to help us, these programs are, are too little right now. The aid packages, while on the surface seem like a lot of money if you look overall when they say they're spending this many billions of dollars in our industry to help us, when you look at it on an individual level, it's actually not that much. So what I'm advocating for is for all our levels of government, especially the provincial and federal governments, to work together to increase those aid packages. Because really those aid packages as they stand are too little. Um, I'll give you some examples. Um, on the wage subsidy, 
the wage subsidy used to uh, fund up to $847 per week for an employee. That amount has actually been decreased. So even though the second wave is worse than the first wave for us, and where the financial challenges have been increased, the wage subsidy has actually been decreased. Um, if you look at the rent subsidy on the surface, uh, we applaud the fact that the rent subsidy is going directly to business owners, not the landlords. So that should get more buy into the program. We like that. But when we really looked at the details, the rent subsidy is actually less than it was before. So we're calling on the government to increase the, wage, uh, the rent subsidy, sorry, and we want both the provincial and federal government to add into that pot to, so that we can get by. And on uh, my third point is on bank loans. Personally, um, I was rejected by my bank for my mortgage and my house to be deferred. Um, for my business on commercial side, we were also rejected for a deferral of our bank loans. Um, this was incredibly deflating for us because in the spring during the first wave, the banks actually deferred our loans for six months. I believe that this was mandated by the government, at, uh, the federal government at the time. So it is beyond my comprehension at this time why the banks can't do that again for us. So you can imagine having a bank loan or a mortgage is one of the biggest expenses that you have. And we need to get through this time to get to the next when days are brighter. So I think the least that they could do is defer our bank loans. Um, I'd like to conclude by saying, um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll agree with what Louis said, you know, we, we do need your support. Um, the government can only support us so much. And if you can buy local, order online for takeout, we'll do whatever you can to help our businesses. And I, I'd like to say that we're part of the solution because between the two businesses that my family owns, and we've been in business for 100 years, we have over 120 employees that we've had to lay off. We want all of those employees back. So please help us get us through this dark time so that we can have everybody back. Back to work, back to doing what they love. And I would argue that the economic recovery will be quicker and faster and more robust if you invest in our small business now so that we don't go out of business. So I see that as a very good investment. Thank you for that opportunity for letting me speak today and please support your local business. Thank you. I wanna thank our special guests today, Louis Manzo and John Pappas and now I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Your first question comes from Steve Cornwell from Mississauga News. Go ahead, Steve. Welcome, Steve. Come here, Crombie. Thanks for the update. Yeah, thank you. Um, just on your uh, on this motion that they're going to the region um, to try and crack down on non-essential um, things being sold in big box stores, uh, can you tell me a bit about the enforcement of that? Like, is this would this be a Mississauga bylaw thing? Would it be? Were you imagining that the region of Peel? Would somehow be involved in um, kind of cracking down on this? Could you just take us through that bit? Yeah, so certainly. I mean, it's our attempt to level the playing field. What's fundamentally unfair is that our small businesses have been forced to close, and yet uh, people are flocking to the big box stores because they have no other options. So it's it's fundamentally unfair. So we're going to ask those large uh, retailers to close off those aisles uh, that are not essential uh, to make it a little fairer. We'll be bringing this motion forward to the region of Peel tomorrow or alternatively, and asking uh, Dr. Lowe to impose his Section 22, which would put this into enforce. So it would be a combination of uh, public health enforcement and city... Anyone. He, he, doctor, I'm getting advice from Dr. Lowe. I'll come ask him to come up and, uh, and speak to this as well, but he's t he tells me that the city can enforce it as well as public health. And so um, it, let, let me ask him to come up as well, Steve. Thank you. 
Yes, thanks, Madam Mayor, and thanks, Steve, for the question. Uh, you know, certainly learning about this motion and uh, and hearing the uh, focus of it, uh, the Pub Peel Public Health team is uh, going to be studying it, both as to uh, what it would constitute and what the best uh, means for uh, regulation would be, whether it is through a Section 22 or some other means. Um, but uh, certainly welcome the discussion and recognize the uh, health and safety as well as the broader uh, community concerns around the uh, motion that's coming forward. Thanks for the question. Follow up. Follow up actually for you, uh, Dr. Lowe, as well. Uh, thank you for the, the previous response. No problem. Um, the uh, the Auditor General of Ontario put out a report today that was um, uh, quite critical of the of the province's um, kind of response to some details on kind of health agencies not uh, being given the authority that they should uh, have and this overall expediency of, of how. Um, Kind of the province has responded. I'm just. This might be delicate uh, for you to kind of discuss. But can you? Has there been any specific kind of issues or concerns you've had about kind of how you know making sure that what you're seeing on the ground uh, in Peel is uh, is supported by by the province and, and their recommendations. Uh, so thanks, Steve, for the question. I mean, I, I, we work very closely at Peel Public Health together with uh, the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Ministry of Health uh, in trying to make sure that the steps that we are taking are, uh, are both protecting our community and also trying to be uh, as least disruptive, least impactful uh, when considering the pandemic picture and the transmission picture that's being observed. Um, you know, I, I certainly recognize that in any uh, pandemic, there's always uh, in many partners, many areas uh, for collaboration. Um, but uh, at this point in time, certainly, I just uh, the report having just come out today, I think uh, there's uh, there's some uh, additional areas for review that I would uh, I would uh, certainly want to go through. Um, but at this point in time, I, I think uh, we, we certainly have a good working relationship with Dr. David Williams and the, and the rest of the Ministry of Health. Um, and I would imagine that uh, that is going to be a critical collaboration for us uh, as we go forward. Thanks very much for the question. Your next question comes from Sean Hunt at City TV. Go ahead, Shauna. Good afternoon, Mayor. Um, I did want to talk uh, about the big box store, this motion you're putting forward uh, tomorrow. Um, can you just maybe describe to me what a Walmart, for instance, would look like? So are you saying that no toys, no home decor, no electronics, no outdoor stuff, and, and, and what it would look like walking into a Walmart? Is it just groceries and pharmacy and, I don't know, diapers? I think you've uh, envisioned that well, Shauna. Nice to <laughs> nice to see you. I hope you're still in Port Credit as well. Um, yeah, so we would uh, we would ask them to block off those aisles, whether they tape them off or block them off, because it's fundamentally unfair that they have the ability to sell those items, sell that merchandise that our local retailers, our local small businesses are not able to sell. So yes, we have to level the playing ground. Let them sell what is essential, which is, as you've described, food products, pharmaceutical products, uh, baby items, etc. Okay. Um, one more question for you quickly. Uh, sure. What is your confidence? What is your confidence level uh, when it comes to getting the numbers of COVID cases down in Peel Region? Is it possible that at the end of this lockdown, it could possibly be a waste of time if we can't get uh, the warehouse spread under control? Uh, so I can only speak to Mississauga. I know Mayor Brown has his own distinct challenges, but I know that people here are being very compliant, and I can see that in the numbers this week already. We've already moved from 117 case cases per 100,000 to 100 cases per 100,000, and even our positivity rates are down. Last week we were at 7.8%. Today we are at 7.9%. So I do see movement. I know people are doing the right thing, and we're asking them to please remember what it was like in March and in April. April when we did stay home, when we worked from home, when we went out as little as possible but only to buy our groceries, get pharmaceutical products, uh, to get gas, go to the bank if we don't do online banking, or to assist others. Maybe we knew a senior that needed us to drop off some groceries or prepared f meals for them. So remember that time last spring. That's what we're asking you to do for the ne period of the next two to three weeks. Next question comes from Vioza Sai at the Pointer. Go ahead, Vioza. Hi, Vioza. Hi, Mayor Crombie. How are you? I'm so. I'm okay. How about you? I'm doing well. Uh, I hope that doesn't count as my first question. But, no, no. but um, 
so um, what do you think of the characterization about um, of public health officials being sidelined um, stemming from the conversation today around the Auditor General's report? And is that true in, in Peel? Oh, well, I will tell you that we have a wonderful relationship with Dr. Lawrence Lowe, and we do heed his advice. We seek it, in fact. He and I communicate daily. Um, uh, with respect to the report that was released, let me say that we, none of us have been through this before, and everyone has the best interests of our residents at their heart. And I know that Premier and his table brought together a team of experts, a team of advisors to advise him, to help him get through this pandemic, and he did the best he could. And, you know, it's easy in retrospect to look back uh, and, 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 and analyze what we could have done better, what should have been done, what could have been done. But the reality is none of us have ever lived through a pandemic before. And we were all learning as we as we went along. And we learned about the virus as, as it evolved as well. So I think he's done a pretty outstanding job. Could we have done better? Each and every one of us could have done better. But, you know, in retrospect, we did the best we could with the information that we had. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and I just wanted to uh, follow up for both you and Dr. Lowe on enforcement. So I understand Peel has 18 inspectors. Um, with the Adamson barbecue controversy in Toronto, um, you know, and they're still open today, um, I'm just wondering if you could speak to the complexities of enforcement. I know uh, last time I had asked about the Halloween party uh, that apparently happened at that establishment in Mississauga, and I heard back that the owner was... Um, given like a talking to uh, from an educational kind of point of view, but I'm wondering if, if um, you know, there are either, if you could speak to whether, uh, not on that particular case, but just the complexities of, of enforcement. Oh, so certainly the uh, enforcement is very complex because we have bylaw enforcement at the city and we have 104 enforcement uh, and security officers, 63 of them security and transit enforcement, 21 mobile and 20 compliance and licensing. Um, they are, they, they uh, go out to uh, proactively and also reactively. So we encourage everyone to call 311 should they see something untoward, whether there are large gatherings, too many cars in one location, uh, large gatherings of people at private settings, etc. Um, and they proactively go to establishments uh, um, to ensure that all the rules and guidelines are being followed. We also have public health inspectors, and why don't I ask uh, Dr. Lowe to speak about those. I will share with you that um, since the lockdown uh, began on Monday, we have not issued any tickets here yet, but certainly there have been many tickets issued while we were in the uh, red zone and the phase two and a half zone with respect to capacity limits and, and tents not being uh, fully utilized as they should be with sides not up, etc. So um, uh, with respect to what occurred yesterday in Etobicoke, I assure you we would have no tolerance for that either and I believe that they will be issued the maximum fine under public health uh, and I believe, uh, you know, I I believe that the establishment we spoke about at the pre-Halloween party also received the maximum fine, and, and I will get, I'll circle back with you um, on that as well. So, Dr. Lowe, I'll ask you to come to the podium. Uh, great, yes. Uh, thanks, Viosa, for the question. Um, a few things. Uh, first of all, enforcement we usually tend to view as, as a bit of a last resort. Um, you know, oftentimes we try to work with uh, business owners. Uh, we try to work with our community. Uh, it's not uh, our role to go in there uh, and uh, and really, you know, guns blazing, basically just try to try to uh, enforce from the get-go. Which is why I think you're speaking to uh, the education piece initially. Uh, and I will say this as well: uh, we, I, I have been really heart, uh, you know, heartened uh, and grateful uh, by uh, the number of business owners uh, that have really. I mean, it's a significant sacrifice uh, that they're making uh, to keep their community uh, safe, to, to keep saving lives, to, um, and to really protect our, health, our frontline healthcare workers and, and, uh, and try to stem the crisis that we're seeing in our hospitals. So, so I want to make that very clear at the, the get-go, that enforcement is, uh, is usually seen as a, as a last resort, and particularly for recalcitrant situations, people that uh, uh, are not necessarily complying. Uh, we do have a number of things that are enforced. Uh, there is the uh, uh, reopening of Ontario Act and all those other pieces, uh, in addition to uh, a few Section 22 orders, uh, Class Section 22 orders that have been issued uh, to individuals with COVID-19 diagnoses uh, and also uh, workplaces. Um, we, uh, we certainly, uh, you know, will 
uh, work with uh, municipal bylaw as well as police to ensure that there's enforcement that's occurring. It's not all on public health inspectors, uh, and, the re and the province's recent announcement also permits, uh, I, I believe, other um, other agencies to also enforce Section 22 orders now, uh, along with a set fine for not complying with Section 22 orders. Um, as Madam Mayor identified, if something like uh, what occurred uh, yesterday at the establishment in Toronto were to happen here, uh, with a clear uh, understanding that this was, uh, you know, uh, premeditated, an individual who's saying, I'm just not having it anymore, uh, I think there would, that would be past the time of education and certainly enforcement action would be taken. And we have also issued tickets and summons uh, to certain workplaces uh, and, uh, and venues uh, that have uh, disregarded uh, the regulations. Uh, the reality is that these are in place uh, to keep all of us safe. Um, you know, and, and I know it's, uh, like I said, it presents hardship uh, for many in our community. Uh, but we have to remember that if the virus uh, were to spread unchecked in our community, I have friends that work in uh, counties across the United States. Their businesses are closed too, and their hospitals are also filling up, and the death toll is rising. So the reality is, you 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 kind of have to go either way. And the important thing is to make sure either way there's there's harm on either sides. And and the important thing is for those of us who are making for those of us who are coming together, for those of us who are uh, making the sacrifice to uh, keep this virus under control. I'm you know I think we're working with them first and foremost. And I certainly hope they get the support they need. Enforcement would be a last resort in really egregious situations like the one that was seen in Tobico. Thanks for the question. Your next question comes from Khalid at My Second Home TV. Go ahead, Khalid. Welcome, Khalid. Thank you, Mayor Crombie. Uh, before I ask you uh, the question, first I want to uh, talk to the two gentlemen, the business owners. Certainly. Who just who just talked uh, right now to everybody. I am really, I feel what you feel, and lots of the people in the community feel you're, you are hurting. And I want to say something. It's time to scrutinize the banks because the bank systems are working like gangs, heartless gangs right now, and they have never listened, and they need somebody to impose something and there's no room for educational talk again. I am really, really frustrated. I because it. it's only business people. It's all the community, every and each person, the kids, the families, and the needy. And I'm sorry to get emotional. You know, I understand your emotion, Khalid. I, uh, John Pappas uh, spoke, first spoke to me about this issue on how banks were calling their operation loans and their personal loans. And I, I will share with you, I spoke to the Premier about it, who indicated to me he would be calling the CEOs of the banks personally to ask them to back off. So why don't I ask John to come up first, John Pappas from uh, Crooked Q, and then Louis Manso from uh, The Cabin will come up next. Thank you. Hi, thank you, uh, um, and uh, Khalid, uh, what can I uh, uh, tell you about the banks? Uh, for, our, for our, what happened to us is that uh, during the first wave of the crisis, banks uh, def deferred our mortgages for six months. And that was really helpful because obviously uh, your bank loan is your biggest expense, both commercially and personally. So during the second wave, we just ex expected that to be uh, honored again because the second wave is worse than the first. But what actually happened is the banks refused. And um, I got to tell you, it was both RBC and CIBC. So we have brought this issue, I believe, to our MP, who uh, spoke to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, we've spoke to the mayor and, uh, and the premier. So hopefully we'll get some traction on that issue, because I can't be the only one that, that, that is feeling that pain of having to pay your bank loans while um, being in lockdown and uh, getting a very little wage subsidy. So um, hopefully uh, we can get some traction on that and, and, and our banks can uh, defer our loans. And um, that's all I can say about that. Thank you. Uh, I too um, am frustrated like most business owners. However, I think if we recognize that we're all in this together in some form or fashion, whether you know, right, you're at level A or level B, I can't speak for everyone, but I do think that <clears throat> the challenges that we faced as a small business and w what 
what change came from it was a fact, the fact that we started to push harder and we started to become advocates for change. We started to collectively get together as communities. We talked um, at our BIA levels and we started to see that there was one common voice. And uh, that's where I feel that our, our biggest effort right now can be, that if we collectively continue talking together and recognizing the challenges that we are faced on a daily basis. I mean, for us, just because we opened the doors uh, after lockdown didn't mean that we went back to full business. As a matter of fact, we went back to 50% if we were lucky. In our downtown stores, we went back to 10%. So the challenges for us, too, are extremely frustrating. Um, banks and big business and, and people that are out there holding the purse strings need to recognize that their contribution needs to be significant. It needs to be now. We can't wait. Um, and we need to be able to collectively send that message to every level of government as well as those people that are responsible for funding. So I appreciate your frustration and concern and we share it as well. Bless you. A follow-up? Dr. Lowe, please. Yeah, we'll call, call Dr. Lowe for you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Go ahead, Khaled, with your question. Dr. Lowe, before I ask my question, um, I feel a little bit concerned because I, I need to ask you how many hours of sleep you get daily. Uh, I've always been a, a light sleeper, so I, I get by four or five pretty good, and then I have uh, the, odd, uh, the odd night where I do catch up. But yeah, usually, I mean, that, that's usually par for the course, though. Do you have a follow-up? Final question. <laughs> oh, no, that was, that was the follow-up. Uh, final question for the day. Final question for the day comes from Ashley Newport at uh, Insanka. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Mayor Crotty. So uh, my question is also about the motion that you're putting forward to council tomorrow. Um, I know that uh, it seems like the idea behind that is that hopefully it will compel people to, instead of going to shop at Walmart or another big box store, that they'll frequent a smaller retailer and do curbside pickup there. But I'm wondering how concerned are you that shoppers themselves, when they go to Walmart, are going to maybe do a little holiday shopping at the same time, that they'll just feel more inconvenienced and be more likely to try to shop somewhere outside of the city? Like, are you a bit worried that this might compel more people to instead of, okay, who can, what local retailer can I support? They can be like, this is just getting more inconvenient. I'm just going to go to Oakville or Milton or Vaughan. Um, are you, how concerned are you about that, that happening as a reaction should the region of Peel decide to compel big retailers to block off their non-essentials? Right. So, yes, I understand it's an inconvenience for people. However, I'm asking them to do the right thing. COVID is inconvenient for anyone. We have struggling small businesses that we all need to step up and support. We're asking people buy local, shop local, shop Mississauga made. Sorry about the inconvenience, but you can go online, uh, it, you can get it sent to you, you can go to pick it up directly with curbside, but uh, this is the small price we're asking people to pay to help support, support those members of their community that are their, our friends and our neighbours and the struggling small business owners who we all know and love. And we want them to survive because if they don't survive, we don't continue to thrive and to prosper. Follow up. Thank you. Uh, and my next question is for Dr. Lowe. Thanks, Ashley. Go ahead with your question. So I wanted to follow up on, uh, so last week when the province uh, announced that it was putting Toronto and Peel to lockdown, one of the things it said it was going to do was give uh, medical officers of health, uh, more power and more ability, I guess, to enforce rules and regulations that are more specific to the regions. I'm wondering if you've learned more about that and if there's anything special in particular that you do for Peel, um, any, uh, beyond the, the big box motion that you guys are. Um, evaluate right now. Um, is there anything else that you're planning to do that's kill specific that might be happening in Toronto? And are you planning on um, going further potentially on enforcement around the holiday season, uh, for example? Uh, so I, I think I want to start by answering this question, Ashley, that I'm very well aware of my position uh, as a uh, public health official. Um, and so certainly while the province has provided additional tools, 
uh, I don't necessarily feel a compulsion to use them unless there is a compelling reason. I recognize that uh, I ultimately serve at the pleasure of our elected officials uh, who ultimately are the decision makers in our community and who have done a, a fine job of uh, trying to lead us through a very uh, unprecedented difficult time and that my powers are appropriately circumscribed uh, to uh, specifically the health and safety of the community and I, I, I do try to use them uh, judiciously uh, in the manner that is needed. Uh, certainly, uh, we know that over the month of November, especially uh, once the new provincial uh, reopening framework was identified uh, and our local picture seemed a little bit uh, uh, different than uh, what was proposed for the red control zone, I did, uh, I did step forward to uh, identify some additional measures uh, that needed to be taken. Um, at this point in time, we're not seeing any additional measures that we need to take uh, at the grey lockdown piece, although we will certainly welcome uh, the direction to uh, study uh, the recommendations in respect of big box retailers. Um, and like I said, you know, all to the point about enforcement, uh, we're really counting on the community to do the right thing here. Uh, to the extent that many people are doing the right thing uh, to keep their, you know, their loved ones, their neighbours, their community safe, uh, that continues to be our focus in our messaging and reaching out to and engaging with the community. Uh, and we will, uh, we won't, I won't hesitate uh, to move to enforce if we need to. Um, but uh, it's certainly the powers that were circumscribed. And I realized I didn't answer the specific question. It's the, uh, the ability to issue tickets on a Section 22. That's the order uh, that was made uh, at the provincial level so that we don't necessarily have to take people to court now uh, for, not, uh, for not abiding with the Section 22 order. Uh, that's the additional power that's there. But at this point in time, we are continuing to study that and to identify if there is a specific need to use it beyond what's, there, uh, what's already been put forward, which is a very significant closure at this point in time. So. Uh, like I said, you know, I'm, I, I'm very, you know, we're, we're, we're working certainly with the community and not uh, uh, against the community. I'm very aware of sort of my powers and the circumscription that uh, exists there too under the Health Protection and Promotion Act. Thanks for the question. That wraps up our press conference for today. I thank everyone on behalf of Mayor Crombie for joining and uh, join us next week. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all for joining.